say not much time to say it in. I'm a 15 minute slot, so I'll um, ask you to bear with us and pay attention as I'm going to take you through a few years of work in a small amount of time. So, uh, the exocrine insufficiency story, um, the specific title I was given about the hidden epidemic, and I use epidemic in diseases and talking about incidents of diseases, but I'm really just, just trying to just show where we think now who we should be sort of testing on. Uh, I don't really want to start going into the complications and treatments um, because, I say, we would um, be here till this evening. So, next. Good. Let's start with the definition. Just make sure we all agree, um, if you can hear me okay there. So, exocrine insufficiency. It's a reduction in pancreatic enzyme activity, not just being produced by the pancreas, but also um, in the intestinal lumen as well. Um, and so, and that means it's below a threshold to maintain normal digestion. So that's a caveat which allows a few things. First of all, it means that you can have low enzymes, but it doesn't mean you've got symptoms. So maldigestion, symptoms from the gut when you've got um, uh, a low exocrine insufficiency, sometimes is thought to not occur until you've got a significantly impaired um, exocrine output. Exocrine insufficiency does not mean chronic pancreatitis. There are numerous causes I'll talk in a minute. Chronic pancreatitis is one of the most common, but it's not the same. Uh, PEI, I'll use now as an acronym, um, can exist with normal levels of enzyme production. It just means it doesn't mix properly, i.e. I've had bypass surgery, I've had a, uh, um, and I've got excess acid secretion, so it all, the pH all messes up in my bowel. And PEI can exist with normal pancreatic tissue. Um, so I'm just not getting the kickstart that I need to produce enzymes. Um, so that's a reduced CCK damage um, with such a small bowel disease. So this results in a few different aspects that can cause it. The consequences of PEI, maldigestion, got symptoms, malnutrition, the micronutrients, fat soluble uh, vitamins that can cause osteoporosis, um, the macronutrients, if it's severe, you know, it goes on to weight loss, and the increased mortality in uh, chronic pancreatitis that's been associated with exocrine insufficiency is mainly in the form of chronic heart disease. But there are other causes as well, especially in pancreatic cancer, where mortality is shown to be um, rapidly uh, decreased, sorry, survival rates where PEI is left untreated. The uh, slide there would really think that you've got someone like this with PEI. But let's face it, the main people we get to see in clinic and the people you get referred tend to look a bit more like this. And uh, that's a picture I took home early before putting my corset on, of course. Yeah, I drink pints, not half, some like that. So causes of PEI, pancreatal diseases, we've talked about chronic pancreatitis, destruction of the pancreas with acute pancreatitis, pancreatic cancers, uh, main cause, 95% of other causes just listed there. Then we've got autoimmune pancreatitis. There's the extra pancreatic diseases that we've talked about, celiac, uh, we've touched on already, inflammatory bowel disease, destroying that bowel that doesn't get that CCK production to your um, pancreas, and diabetes as well. Diabetes, you think, well, isn't that pancreas? in that pancreatic disease, but a lot of the mechanisms in diabetes, such as autonomic neuropathy and things like that, and the islet cell uh, issue is the, um, is the main cause of that, so it's classed as extra pancreatic. Zolo-Gallinson syndrome, the acid secretion, and post-surgical states, as we've talked about, especially with the Whipples and post-surgery, so post-pancreatic post resection is one of the major causes as well we see in our center. So the size of the problem at the moment, um, it's about 11,000 patients each year, um, develop exocrine insufficiency if we put the get together the cancers and the chronic pancreatitis patients. Chronic pancreatitis itself um, is quite rare if you actually look at a population prevalence. It varies greatly. It's about 13 to 557 new patients per million in Europe and it ends up resulting with about 40,000 prescriptions for enzyme replacement in the UK annually. So it's common and it's big business. And it's a big implication. Classical pathway, we think about people with exocrine insufficiency, they get recurrent uh, subclinical pancreatitis, they drink alcohol, they get recurrent pancreatitis, and five to ten years later, um, or longer if it's not an alcohol um, uh, insult such as hereditary pancreatitis, they get a large destruction of their parenchyma, um, they get lots of inflammation, clinical reduction in exocrine insufficiency, and this is an, uh, classically thought as an end stage thing that happens at the end of pancreatitis, so don't worry about that till the end. However, when we talk about people and look for it a lot more, we found that things are a lot more earlier than that. And the malabsorption and malnutrition tends to be much more apparent, not just in um, chronic pancreatitis, but even when there's no structural structure there. Structure is really um, 
focused on when we talk about chronic pancreatitis as well. And there's a big meta-analysis in guts earlier um, in 2017. And actually one of the indications for the uh, inclusion criteria was structural changes in the pancreas. And what's really important and what the conclusion with this is, is if you've got a structural change in your pancreas, you've got evidence of um, poor fat absorption um, with what, uh, the test that they used. And 17 studies and meta-analysis, if you give them enzyme replacement, they get better. So therefore, we've got a diet definition of a disease, we've got a mechanism, and we've got a solution that seems to work with grade 8 one evidence. So we're doing the right thing when we find it. So we've got to find it. So are we failing to detect it? Are we just getting them all? Are these people all having CTs? Because everyone seems to get a CT now. Um, the global prevalence of uh, chronic pancreatitis, for example, is well, one of the major causes. Is about 13.5. So yeah, if you round that down into percentages, it's about 0.01% if you actually um, uh, to, you know, to, uh, take a prevalence from uh, registry and for clinical uh, missions and GP databases. However, if you suddenly actually look at post-mortem studies, you'll suddenly see that uh, about 6 to 12% of patients actually have a chronic crunchy pancreatitis. Um, you know, so it's, it's much more evident when you actually look at um, uh, post-mortem studies. Now, these studies were quite old. Um, you know, you look at 1970s, 1964, when people used to have better access to these things and include patients, um, a series about sort of to about 20 patients. The, um, so we've repeated that because um, we're trying to be modern and clever. The new way to get, find out why you've died, if you're interested, is to have a digital autopsy. So you go to a CT scanner, um, obviously with the help of somebody, and um, they will scan you <laughs> and they will tell you why you died. Um, so um, really helpful, um, and um, it works. It's, and it's catching on, funnily enough, um, because you know a lot of people don't want to be messed around. You know, just look, if you need to know, just put them through the scanner. So lots of causes, and as long as you get them quick enough, um, your pancreas is one of the first things, sadly, to start trying to dissolve with everything else. And um, you can find calcium quite happily; it hangs around in the pancreas. So of the 356 patients that we analysed, um, we funnily enough found 13.5% seen that statistic before, up to 12%, had pancreatic calcification, one of the most specific um, uh, identifiers of chronic pancreatitis. So there's a lot of people around there with um, chronic pancreatitis. Now, could we have picked those up earlier? Well, um, testing for chronic pa uh, pancreatic exocrine insufficiency as a marker you know, of PEI, is, uh, sorry, a marker of PEI, the gold standard is a, uh, as you always read about, is this coefficient of fat absorption which I don't know if you've ever read about this test. Um, it's a hundreds of grams of fat a day. Um, anyone's into dry, lard and dripping will be fine with this, but you know, there's your 500 lump of lard that you have to eat over five days. Um, I'm not tempted. Um, collect all your feces for three, day three to five. Now, anyone who's eaten that amount of lard, trust me, you'll be pooing. <laughs> Large volumes of feces, you ain't gonna do it, man. You just do not do it. And, and so, you know, as an outpatient, you know, Come on, as an inpatient. And then it gets to the lab. And there's a great study from, uh, there was a great report from Derby actually about the actual pickup rates and the compliance of labs uh, when they stopped doing this test. And actually, it, to be honest, it doesn't exist in a clinical setting. It still works in a research setting. So most studies you'll see now on PEI, if they've been done in a control scenario, will have a, as a gold standard. But you have to pay people a lot of money to handle the thing. So it's not often you'll see me colour some poo gold. But there you are. Didn't think that today when you woke up. Took me a while to sort that slide as well. So what tests have we got? I'm not going to go through all the tests. The one that does work is a fecal elastase um, because it's the only one that's available. Um, there are numerous reasons why we don't have breath tests. Secreting MRI at the moment is a nightmare because we can't get all the secreting and expense. So at the moment, we're stuck with this test. Two things to remember about this test is it has a um, poor sensitivity in early PEI, so low sort of uh, early PEI. So until it becomes moderate or severe, um, it becomes um, much more sensitive, i.e. it'll pick it up and not miss any. The other thing is that it's not got a perfect, um, uh, I'll find my laser. Um, so there is areas of specificity where sometimes uh, one out of 20, about one out of 10, will be a false positive. So if someone is classed as a uh, PEI because they've got a low fecal elastase, repeating the sample um, to make sure that it's not diluted or they've not picked up half the bottle of toilet water with it when it's there is quite important. Um, so just watch out for that. 
however, um, we use it and it gets, um, and it's the most readily available uh, tool we have. So what if we apply this in our GI clinic? Um, we looked at this in two centers, um, all comers, um, nearly 2,000 of them came and we tested them all as they came and we asked to get them to bring a stool sample. They were quite good at this because they're already doing the calprotexins, of course. Um, and we found again, hey presto, 13.1% of patients had a low FEL1, fecal elastase. 80% of them got better with enzyme replacement, which probably explains that maybe that 20% were either a false positive or they weren't taking it or whatever. Big indicators for that were steatorrhea, floaty, smelly, pale stool, weight loss, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and bloating. So not really constipation. However, when we actually scanned them and thought, oh, there's anything going on in your pancreas, then it's causing all your symptoms. Uh, there were a group of patients who um, uh, didn't have anything macroscopically wrong with the pancreas. So it's almost like the disease, uh, the exocrine insufficiency was going on without chronic pancreatitis. This isn't a prevalence of chronic pancreatitis. This is exocrine insufficiency. So, you know, if you think of the amount of referrals you may get from your colleagues, uh, gastroenterologists, to put people on FODMAP diets for their bloating, steatorrhea, weight loss, abdominal pains, and you just think if they've had a um, stool test done for FEL1 before they uh, commence on lots of hard work from you guys, um, you really should think about maybe testing. We've obviously historically had uh, me and uh, one of the, John Lees ran this study, um, who's now one of our colleagues up in uh, Freeman, who's um, uh, found that actually it's diarrhea predominantly to bowel, i.e. the bloating, the pain, not just chronic diarrhea, found to have a prevalence of about 6.1%. Um, as opposed to just chronic diarrhea, no pain, no bloating. Um, and, um, uh, you know, a significant number of people, 6.1%. Um, so we test a lot of the times in diarrhea predominantly irritable bowel because of that. Diabetes prevalence was th normal throughout. And you actually look at these patients and you give them enzyme replacement, um, you'll find about 60% get better. Again, it probably relates the um, failure of the test rather than the actual... Um, uh, uh, whether whether the diagnosis is wrong or they're not responding. However, it also uh, stressifies the point that you should really retest people as well if they have got a positive result as well before putting them on lifelong enzyme replacement. So does this supportive evidence? Well, some great studies around. Yes, if you're not very good at digesting fats and you eat a lot of fat, um, you're going to get symptoms because um, fat upsets your bowel. So if um, there's some great studies out there where people just went home and ate lots of fat, um, got the bloating and, and diarrhea, and if you take the creon or uh, take the enzyme replacement, uh, the um, other, other makes are available. Um, uh, the um, uh, it's uh, you know you, you you tolerate your diet a lot better. So um, so you know we've looked at the primary care study, and um, clock's going down. Um, the uh, and you know, why are you taking the calprotectin? You know. If, we, we looked at the primary care study of people being referred in with irritable, you know, with irritable bowel type symptoms. You know, you know the data's there, 25% of patients, no, the population have a bowel irritability, 50% see their GP, and 20% you know, get on to primary care, uh, secondary care. So why shouldn't they just have a you know, second sample sent at the same time? Cost-wise, it's about 40 pounds, but you know, the actual hassle of getting through once you know, to secondary care, which takes six months, then everything else. So, you know, just take two bottles into the toilet as opposed to the shower. Um, diabetes, um, I think it's quite established now where diabetes is a risk factor for PEI. It's thought to be, um, uh, you know, if you've got less insulin coming out of your eyelid cells, less trophic uh, monitoring, uh, and so therefore it's type one is the, is the main uh, culprit for uh, pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. Um, you talk in some studies going up to about 56%. I would probably say it's more like the 25, looking at lots of different meta-analysis. It's type 1 diabetes, insulin-dependent type 2 diabetes, but not non-insulin-dependent diabetes. They have, uh, there's a quite a good um, study by Bjorn Lindqvist recently come out um, from the Swedish uh, Gothenburg team, uh, looking at, yeah, it's so uh, type 2 diabetes um, on tablets do not have an increased prevalence. However, so if you've got poor glycemic control, if, you're, if, if people have got diabetes and problems with their bowels and bloating, test them. Celiac disease, I think Pom will have covered it. 30% if you're not getting better. And dyspepsia. 
there's no, there's no, there's no things that have gone gone yet. So here's my final two slides. So the reality of PEI. So we've known, I think, established with pancreatic cancer, chronic pancreatitis, and cystic fibrosis. It's all there. We're just really in the community, and especially the patients that you're going to be seeing as well now, um, and just double check on them. Um, there are a group with celiac disease. There's inflammatory bowel disease cohort now coming through as well. Um, more evidence is needed with the IBD cohort. Diabetes is definitely there. Type 1 insulin. Um, HIV is growing. I haven't got time to discuss the data about that, but the irritable bowel is one of the really main culprits we've got in this environment, which you guys are interfacing with and are so helpful for, and we want to make sure that we send the patients to you primed, ready for that. And even dyspeptic patients, you could, we, we should really start to screen as well. Um, so we talk about this as an iceberg study, um, what we knew and what lies under the water, which is yet undiscovered. So it's probably going to about 12% of the population if you really think about those post-mortem studies we're talking about. So just like an iceberg, your floaty stool can come in and take over. There we are, I see. So remember your steatorrhea. It took me a while to that one as well. So conclusions, it's common, um, check for it. Um, I think uh, the main thing is, if you want to test for it, we only have a, uh, a, a, a fecal elastase. In high-risk groups, you don't need to. You just get on and treat the cancers and the, uh, so the pancreatic cancer, we just get on and treat these days. And patients uh, for irritable bowel um, should be investigated, I think, before we fill, especially for dietary modification. And testing patients and your, G your GI patients will have a diagnostic yield. Thank you very much.